Our guest this afternoon is a DJ, producer from Brooklyn. He's been making music for about 10 years now. Um, runs a rather diverse and also rather excellent record label called Mixpack. Um, and in some interesting turn of events has become one of the world's most sought after dancehall producers, working with the likes of Beanie Man, Vibes Cartel, Popcorn, and some guy called Snoop Lion. Uh, so has a lot of stuff going on, I think a lot of stories to tell. Give him a very warm welcome. <laughs> oh. So maybe should we play some music to start off? Yep. Cool. So this is a record that came out two weeks ago. Three weeks ago? When did it came out? Four weeks ago. Four weeks ago. Okay, sorry. If we got a wine to them for your friends, me not if I go in and me bed soon. Everybody happy and we know they die too. Tell a marsh like so, which I wine and the tattoo. Send me fresh like April and hot like you. Sharper than razor, we know cartoon. They must sit down in a circle and be glam. Send me a dick and talk talk for the country. They must give me what's up, BB can talk. Position was a pose, send me like that. To me, she camera, take a one snap. You are the wallpaper, for me love now. For me, I like it down like the bass drop down. Your friend, they must free me, for me not stop. You are true, let me look like that. So I think there's quite a lot to be said about the music, the influences on this record, but maybe we could start off by you telling us how this record actually came about, because it has quite an interesting and long history, right? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely kind of an interesting uh, story behind it. I mean, that the instrumental was kind of uh, a rhythm I had released last summer called the Loudspeaker Rhythm. Um, and if you're not familiar with... Um, dance hall rhythm culture. I mean, it's quite common to get multiple songs written on the same instrumental track. Um, so, so the original release had Popcon, Beanie Man, um, Natalie Storm, and Marshall Montano. Um, and so it, it did quite well as a rhythm release, and Popcon's track, The System, 
was uh, pretty well received in Jamaica and elsewhere. And uh, Masha Montana, who's a soca artist from Trinidad, his track was also pretty well received. And I basically got approached um, by Puma, the the brand, and they they were interested in me doing a new version on the rhythm. And and the kind of directive was, you know, we'd like to get a new female uh, vocal. And I kind of thought it might be an interesting opportunity to move outside the dance hall Caribbean context. Um, so I reached out to, so the, the, the lead vocalist is Megan James, who's in Purity Ring, if you're familiar, like an electronic uh, act, and with, with a guest verse from Popcorn. So I reached out to Megan James' management, um, just because I, I was a fan of her work, and despite being on tour and being quite busy, she was interested, uh, like the track, and uh, so she was able to record record that kind of, I think, in a hotel room while she was on tour. And uh, and then I kind of thought it could use a little bit more energy um, and it would be interesting to bring it back with PopCon. So I, PopCon actually, I think, delivered three different verses. And I think the first two, they were good, but they didn't feel quite right. So I ended up flying down to Kingston for a very quick 24-hour trip. <laughs> and... Uh, it was, I think I went in the studio at like midnight, worked till 6 a.m. and flew out into the next morning. Um, and so he got that track done. But yeah, I mean, I, th- I think one thing that draws me to dance hall and, and particularly as a producer is just that you have this unique opportunity to, to do different, hear different vocalists and different songs on the, the track or the beat that you make. And it's really interesting to see the different energy and the different vibe that people can find in a track. Um, so I'm really happy with what she found and what Popcorn brought to the table. So if you look at the original loudspeaker release, um, the artists on that rhythm are already pretty diverse. Like you got whatever, Marshall Montana was a soccer artist. Then you have Popcorn was a dancehall artist, but has a very melodic kind of way of whatever, singing. Um, so it's very different vocalists and very different energy levels. How do you approach a rhythm like that as a producer? Do you have any specific vocals in mind and then see what other people do with it or would you rather try and create something which can work for quite a lot of different vocalists yeah i mean i i guess not just in the dance hall context but in general i'm always one of my favorite things is getting bringing a track that inevitably in the process of making i've heard it hundreds of times basically um and so it kind of is imprinted on my mind as an instrumental so one of my favorite things is to take it to a vocalist and kind of you know, that's where it really becomes a collaboration. And it's quite often that I'm just completely blown away or very surprised with choices the vocalist will make. Um, so, I mean, uh, Megan's vocal on this is very kind of laid back and ethereal. And that wouldn't have been necessarily, I mean, I know her work, so it wasn't a complete, complete surprise. But, you know, it's not exactly what I pictured on the on the rhythm, but at the same time, totally excited to get that back and same thing with the popcon uh version on his track the system i mean he he did kind of a very heartfelt kind of uh sufferation song about the ghetto youth and having lived with the track for some years actually before it got voiced i was just kind of surprised that, that that's what he heard in the track um and so yeah you know i mean it's really it's kind of a thrill to see what different people find i mean as a producer i don't necessarily want to dictate to a vocalist like this is exactly what I want you to do yeah. I mean sometimes I do have that conversation mm-hmm. and it's it's a back and forth conversation but a lot of times you know if I feel like the artist is a competent you know creator I want I want I want them to bring their own thing to the table and I don't want to step on their toes before they get to offer that up now you mentioned the system maybe we could play the video that was a, a huge record in the dance scene I think um, and it's also quite different from what we just heard, despite the fact that it's the same rhythm track, so we could play it. Just need to find it. I think it's the other, it's the other one, right? Yeah. Two pretty clothes, 
house in my closet None of them not see my pain Furthermore, them never ask yet Silence of the body serpent So you know what I do, I talk less Man I work every day down a walk on a tree Gonna weak them a accept Them no want me to build my house No want me to work, no asset Separation, everyone me done So give thanks to Jack when you pass it So, get a youth that makes silly plan Believe in yourself, be a man Them want me to dead for the road Them no want me to make millions Yes, girl, where the system do forget to you So you talk about this as if it was the most normal thing in the world. Yeah, I flew out to Jamaica 24 hours, just recorded PopCan, but how did it actually happen that you would start working with these people? I mean, for, for those of you who don't know, like this guy is a huge deal. Like he's probably one of the three biggest reggae dancehall artists right now, arguably the biggest. So when did you first start working with artists of that caliber from Jamaica? Yeah, I mean, basically, as a producer, I've always wanted to be working with vocalists. Um, And I think it was probably 2008 that I, um, you know, I've been working with different people in the U.S. and, and trying to work with different people in the U.S. Um, but I had kind of made a decision that I wanted to reach out and try to work with some uh, Jamaican vocalists. So I think I, I basically, at that point, I had no real connections or, you know, I, I hadn't really been down to Jamaica to work. And um, so basically through the Internet, I found kind of some people in the world of dance hall. Um, What does that mean, through the internet, <laughs> kind of some people? That's, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, essentially, you know, just asking around and getting kind of like, oh, you need to talk to this person, you need to talk to, to, to that person, that sort of thing. So, you know, through, through my work as a DJ and just um, talking with different DJs and then they tell me to call this person or email this person. Um, so I, I basically was able to work with Sizzla and that was something where I, I didn't get to meet him and I still haven't met him um, but you know basically I had a rhythm sent it down uh, through email and he sent you know Pro Tool session back and then I finished mixing and making the song and um, I repeated that process with Vibes Cartel and when I reached out to him he was obviously a very big artist but he still hadn't kind of hit his full peak um, his track Romping Shop was just kind of building buzz in the U.S. and that went on to be like a, a Billboard uh, Hot 100 sort of radio play type of song that really built him up that much more. So it was a little bit fortuitous, but again, that was facilitated through the Internet. And uh, yeah, I guess basically he, he, he voiced a track for me called You Love. And, you know, I, I didn't really get to interact with him about the track too much and I didn't know what I would be getting back but he sent this track you love which was very romantic kind of love song a little bit unusual for him and uh, 
and it just kind of took on a life of its own and became a big hit on its own. So, I mean, ultimately, I, I guess I, it was very fortuitous and a bit lucky. Um, but through that song, um, then people started coming to me, you know, emailing me and saying, like, you know, we'd like to do this with you or do that with you. Um, and about maybe nine months or so after You Love kind of had been out and had been building, I started going down to Jamaica. So I got to meet Cartel. And uh, and it kind of went from there. So you're originally from Massachusetts, right? <coughs> Where exactly? Um, well, actually, I was born in Cleveland. Okay. And uh, my family moved around, but yeah, my, my uh, folks live up in Massachusetts. Um, but I've been in, in Brooklyn for about eight years and was down in Philadelphia before that. Why did you move to Brooklyn? Because of the music or was there any other reason? Um, no, it was just, it was kind of like a bunch of friends um, of mine were living in a warehouse in Brooklyn and a, a room opened up and it was just kind of like, you know, there wasn't a strong reason, but just like s something that happened. So you've been making music for maybe like 10 years, a bit more, um, but your first release, if I'm not wrong, was in 2007-ish, and I think people started to notice more what you do in 2009 when you launched <coughs> your own label. So what did you do between 2002 and 2007? Um, well, I was I was doing a lot of different sorts of things in New York, but uh, in terms of like creative pursuits, I was, you know, when I moved into uh, Brooklyn, I actually moved into this four-story warehouse, and pretty much everyone, apart from myself, had gone to art school and was pretty engaged in the New York art world. And um, a number of us were doing different performance type art or installationy sort of things with video and. Uh, and audio so that that was kind of my my original like creative output when i when i got to new york um and a lot of that work was kind of like reworking popular culture say with editing videos or or kind of reappropriating different pieces of music and and it was it was good and it was interesting and we had some levels of success although doing performance art, you cannot really make too much money. <laughs> I mean, there's there's nothing to sell. It's a one-time thing. So, I mean, there's a lot of effort, and it's this ephemeral sort of thing that's basically gone. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, working in a group, people had different ideas about what, you know, was important to them or, or so forth. And for me, at a certain point, I realized, you know, I don't want to be, like, deconstructing culture like this popular music or popular, you know, films or, or, or video content, I'd rather try to build it up from scratch. So I think that was the real shift for me. I just was like, I would rather be making popular music or, you know, or, or, or songs um, that have a life of their own instead of just like tinkering with someone else's songs and, and, and video. So the whole idea of making popular music, pop music, was that always thump something that was of interest to you? That's something that inspired you? Because obviously you came up through the whole club scene at large, you know, putting out, being a DJ producer, putting out 12-inch kind of releases and, and, and being somewhat of a household name in that world. And now you're working with people like Snoop Dogg and other people that I'm not allowed to mention. So that's quite a journey. It's quite a transition and I think very different types of working as well. So was that always your ambition to be that type of producer or did it just accidentally happen? Um, that's that's a good question. I mean, I think making pop music, and I use that term very broadly, I mean, for me, working with these dance hall artists is kind of making popular music. I mean, it's within a genre, but, you know, it's songs that, that take on, you know, life as songs, and I, I guess that's really what I mean when I say pop music. But I think the draw there is partially just because I, f I felt like it was the hardest thing for me to do. Um, And it, was, it, it wasn't like, oh, I naturally, I know how to make pop music and that's what I'm going to go do. It was kind of like this challenge, like how, how is pop music made or how, as a producer, how do you make full songs and refine them? And, you know, so in a way it was just like the challenge of it that was somehow a draw. And, and I think just over the course of my life, songs, you know, have lived in my mind or in my life more than just like, say, a club track or something, you know, th those can be amazing beautiful things and they have certain contexts where they work you know absolutely perfectly but i don't know there's something about songs that had a, a real pull on me 
So having worked with popular culture on a more theoretical level as, an, as a performance artist, um, does that inform your work if you try and, and write a pop song these days? Or is this something that you try to keep away from your creative process and just do? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I do... I'm not like I don't come to music as a as a super skilled musician, you know. I, I really, um, you know, I, I didn't kind of grow up playing piano or guitar or something like that in a really formal way. So I think for me, it started by looking at songs and having to kind of take them apart, almost. I, I don't know about theoretically, but just conceptually, like what is, you know. And this is a verse, okay, how many bars is that? And this is a pre-chorus. Yeah. How many bars is that, and how does that lead into the chorus? So just really kind of analyzing music in that way um, and then trying to kind of analyze it enough that, that it becomes intuitive and then you can, you know, take different things from different genres or different um, different types of songs and kind of create new songs using some of that kind of DNA, if you will. Speaking of different genres, on your label you release quite a lot of different music. So yeah, we have a punk band. Um, you put out some New Orleans bounce stuff, um, some clubby electronic stuff, obviously dancehall. So did you always listen to like all these kinds of genres, or was there anything that attracted you in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think probably like with my love of rap music and hip hop, um, you know. That music has has not not always, but it's often uh, relied on sampling, and so in a way, I think that that's when I look back. That's what I think happened is that, you know, whether it's like a a, a DJ uh, premiere track, or uh, or Public Enemy or whoever. I mean, you you depending on how you relate to to music in general. I mean, for me as a producer, I'm kind of wondering, okay, where are those samples coming from? And, and then kind of tracing those roots to the original source material. Um, quite naturally, you're going to end up listening to, you know, a huge, a wide, wide range. I mean, I think many hip-hop producers will tell you, you know, I listen to everything. Yeah. And I think it's that kind of year of, of realizing that there's amazing music across all genres. So how did you actually start making music then? Um, I, I think I, I started not with a computer, but with a four track, you know, with a, a little uh, cassette tape. And, you know, in some ways there's a certain freedom to that because it's very limited what you can do. Um, and, and so, you know, you can, you can record, set the tape to play at different speeds and record at different speeds and do different kind of experimental stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I quickly graduated to a computer and really, you know, it's just, As a, as a producer, just a solitary sort of pursuit, you know, kind of like became a, a hobby and then a passion and, you know, now more of a career, so. Yeah. So what's your setup these days then? Do you still try to limit yourself in terms of the equipment now that you probably have access to more professional and more um, well-staffed? Yeah, students? I mean, I, th I think I do. I, I, I know some producers are very kind of And they make a conceptual decision like I'm making music with this drum machine and this synth and that's like what this project is yeah. or you know something very defined like that I don't quite do that but you know I, I pretty much strictly make music on a laptop <laughs> whether I'm in a in a studio or you know at home or in a hotel room or any really anywhere and that freedom you know I mean actually the 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 loudspeaker rhythm that was for, that was the track behind first time and uh, and popcorns the system that was recorded on an airplane you know I mean like the original idea was was just done on an airplane sitting you know on the tray table so yeah I mean I, I really think it's a unique thing that we are able to make music kind of wherever we are you know if 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 we have an, a laptop. Um, and so I try to take advantage of that rather than confine myself to, say, something that has to be in a studio context. So you mentioned Vibes Cartel before. I don't know if all of you guys are familiar with him. He's probably the most influential dancehall artist of the past, whatever, five to ten years. 
and I would like to tr uh, play a track, which is uh, the other video. I hope I managed to <laughs> do this properly this time around. Show me the go go vine girl. Show me the go go vine girl. Vine a waist in a time and be a man. Now you can't have no spine girl. Show me the go go vine girl. Show me the go go vine girl. Vine a waist in a time and be a man. Now you can't have no spine girl. Show me the when you step in on the club. Every man come fi see you a rubber down. A superstar that's what you become. Spin from the pole from top to the ground. So you're full of fun Tears when me cry for you could have full of drum Me don't want to leave all when the club done Baby Me love how you style the place Me love how you wind your waist Up and down like a yo-yo Me feel set me in love with a go-go Show me the go-go wine girl Show me the go-go wine girl Me love how you style the place Me love how you wind your waist Up and down like a yo-yo Me feel set me in love with a go-go Show me the go-go wine girl Show me the go-go wine girl Wind your waist in a time and be a man Now you can have the spine girl Show me the go-go wine girl Show me the go-go wine girl Wind your waist in a time and be a man Now you can have the spine girl Show me the every woman go Cause me can't get enough of you, get enough of you That obsession, yeah, me can't let go Me not rest, no, 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 no. me get you Listen to the words come out of my mouth Me chopping on your game without a timeout The way you a creep up in on my timeline But why if you go to live high now? Me love how you style the place Me love how you wind your waist Up and down like a yo-yo You set me in love with a go-go Show me the go-go wine girl Show me the go-go So you mentioned you had recorded the first track over the internet, <coughs> but then you ended up going to Jamaica and actually working with him in the studio, and you ended up producing his whole album, which I think is quite an uncommon thing in dancehall to do anyway, just produce an entire album. And then for you to not come from that scene, and obviously only having worked with him over the internet, how exactly did that happen? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I mean, it was, it was a bit of a fortuitous random thing, but You know, based on the strength that you love, um, I had made plans to, to, to go down to Kingston to record a bit more. And uh, and so I got in the studio with Cartel. 
and I think I brought three or four tracks for him to record on, and he works incredibly quickly. I mean, it's it's pretty. What's quickly? How long does a song like this take to come together? I'm, I for mean, it, it's I've never heard of anything this quick or or heard, or work with anyone, but even heard of anything. And the way it would usually work is I, I show up with with the music. I don't play him 20 beats and he picks three. I play him four beats and he records on all four. So generally he will sit down in a chair. The The track's already loaded up in Pro Tools and the lights go down. The mic is turned on. He's got no pen and paper. And the first time he hears the song, the record button is already pushed on the mic. And so he's just, maybe for the first 10 or 15 minutes he's just listening back and he's kind of starting to like not mumble but kind of hum and just kind of make <laughs> guttural sort of sounds and find cadences and melody ideas um and you know within about 10 or 15 minutes he's and, and and i should say he'll he'll tell the engineer like keep that little bit or keep that little bit even though you know it's just like this half a, a non-verbal sort of thing and and so that'll be saved and muted And those are kind of his guide reference points when he feels like he found something uh, quite good. And so then within 10 or 15 minutes, he's now recording words onto the track. And, you know, within an hour, maybe an hour and a half, the song is completely written, completely recorded. He's recorded his doubles, his ad-libs. I mean, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. And I, I think it's because, I mean, he, he's incredibly hardworking Uh, entertainer. I mean, I think he probably is recording like 15 songs a week for years, if not for over a decade. And so he's definitely done like three or four thousand songs or more. So he's really honed something and obviously he has a, this deep talent. Um, so, you know, I think when I went down there that first time we, we did three or four songs in one or two nights and at the end of it he kind of said like, you know, I think we made a mini album. And I don't think prior to that trip or anything I was I would dream like, oh, yeah, I should produce it. Uh, a Vibes Cartel album. Like, that kind of was outside the, the realm of what might be possible, so I don't even think I imagined that. But when he said that, I was kind of like, and, you know, we, and we had been getting along well, and it felt like a good creative connection. But I was like, well, what do you think? I don't know, maybe we should do, like, an album. And he was like, definitely, we should definitely try to do that. So... You know, then it, it took about a year, but I would go down maybe th uh, four or five times over over a course of, of the next year, and I would bring him three or four songs every time. Yeah. So it's three days of tracking him down and then 30 minutes of recording. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I definitely spent, you know, days in, in Kingston just kind of waiting <laughs> where he would be like, yeah, it's uh, 8 p.m. tonight, we're good. And then at 8, he's like, 10. Yeah, we're good at 10. Yeah, we're good at midnight you know and then he never <laughs> he never shows up so it was really you know it, it was a certain amount of patience and uh and waiting but i kind of knew that that was part of the deal so it wasn't uh so bad but yeah once we got in the studio it was just like unbelievable so apart from the waiting which i think everybody's familiar with who's ever been to jamaica before uh Can you tell us a bit more about how it's like coming there? I mean, the place is pretty special, obviously. <coughs> uh, the role that music plays in the country is incredible, probably unlike anywhere else in the world. So maybe you can tell us a bit more. How is it like like touching down for the first time? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I didn't completely know what to expect the first time. Um, at this point, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to go to many studios and meet a lot of different people in the business, uh, vocalists and producers and everything. And, and to go to a lot of parties and, and see sound systems and everything. And, yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's unbelievable. Like, this island that has, I think, about three million people, just like the number of studios and successful artists per capita, and, and the, the, particularly that has, like, such an international reach. I don't know if there's another place in the world that kind of um, has anything similar. So it is it is very special to be able to, to, to work with artists that come from that culture because music is such a deeply ingrained part of, of or there's such a, a deep history there yeah. so now you mentioned there's a lot of successful artists there um, at the same time the industry I think is struggling um, it's 
pretty hard for like artists to create substantial revenue just because it's a small island and it's kind of hard to cross over internationally in the way obviously people don't buy records anymore and I think reggae suffered probably more from that than any other genre but you at the same time are pretty successful with what you do and seem to be able to make a living so why do you think that is? Um, well, well I think maybe I'm not totally sure but maybe I have a bit of a benefit from not having been deeply involved in the the dance hall business as it has been hist historically structured, you know, I mean, there's different labels like VP and, and then, you know, in the early 2000s, a lot of U.S. or international major labels were signing um, artists like Elephant Man and, and uh, Beanie Man and other artists to big kind of international deals that would give them a big push internationally. Um, but with, you know, unfortunately, like say in the U.S., Dance hall has a pretty limited ability to reach uh, radio, you know, major radio, because for whatever reason, New York, Hartford, Boston, and uh, maybe Atlanta and Miami are kind of like the main radio markets, but a lot of the country is shut out or, or shuts out dance hall. So it does make it a bit harder, and, and there maybe it becomes a chicken and the egg thing where ARs at majors are thinking, well, we we shouldn't invest in this because the radio is uh, the, the radio potential is limited and therefore the sales potential is limited at the same time you know the the radio people are probably seeing like oh the labels aren't really pushing this so we shouldn't really go out on a limb and, and, and try to see what this track can do but I mean in terms of what I've been doing um, in, in so far on the business side I just think you know there is a huge demand and a huge love of, and appreciation of this music around the world and so given that the the music industry as it's been known to exist is kind of crumbling i think it's a good time to be like a disruptor and try to find new ways whether it's new revenue streams or just new ways to present the music to different different people who might not um be core kind of core market dance hall fans so one of the problems obviously that this scene is facing is some of the lyrical content um and just because it's very specific to uh the culture i guess um and you coming from a totally different culture how did you find relating to some of the things that an artist like cartel talks about in his lyrics like whatever bleaching or certain views on sexuality that are very very far away from I think the kind of people that you would be dealing with here in New York um, how did you find dealing with this sort of conflict or this sort of contrast? Yeah well I mean a couple things just generally as a producer who's not usually writing lyrics you know it's always interesting because when you collaborate with someone you know you're turning over a, or you're giving up a certain amount of control And particularly if you make the music and someone else is writing the lyrics, you know, wh whether it's a, a pop song or a dancehall song or, or a rap song or anything else, I mean, you know, does everything that rapper said on your beat, does that speak to you directly or to your experience or, or just do you, are you 100% behind every word that was said or every thought that was put out there? So it's an interesting, it's an interesting aspect of being a producer you know um but with respect to, to cartel say or, or working with dancehall artists you know i mean i feel like pretty good about the messages he's sharing like say on kingston story i mean it's a it's a wide range of, of songs some of it's kind of separation stuff some of it's like definitely for the club and parties and our go go wine is kind of a song um for for uh for the dancers and you know I mean I, just to watch that music kind of have a life you know I think I feel I can feel good about it I mean there, there's another track on the album called Half on a Baby and you know it, it's amazing when you put out music into the world all sorts of things will happen that you could have never possibly anticipated so that song for some strange reason really took hold in the Bronx and in New York And not even with the, the core dance hall crowd, but actually with more of a, a, a Latino crowd. And there's this dance called 
the Bronx Wine, which is like huge with like 15 year old kids in, in, in the Bronx and in Brooklyn and all around New York. Can you show it to us? <laughs> no, no, sir. <laughs> um, but, you know, go on YouTube and, and, and type in Bronx Wine. I mean, with that song, for example, and, and in terms of kind of new revenue streams and, and, and working in this business, and, and again, we didn't plan for this, but like every day for the last year, there's like 10 to 20 people uploading videos of themselves in front of their webcams doing the, the Bronx Wine. So that, just, even though we didn't do a video for that song, and even though we, we didn't get to fully push it as a single the way we would have liked, you know, it just got picked up by these kids. And, you know, we, 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 we monetize all these videos, and that's okay, but it, more importantly, it kind of made the song become one of the best-selling, I think it's been like the best-selling cartel song in the U.S. for like the last five months, and that's just through this kind of very viral, organic development. So how important is YouTube as a revenue source for you running a label? Like, how does Mixpack make money? I mean, obviously everyone knows nobody's buying records anymore. There's some sales, digital sales, but this can't possibly uh, be enough money to make a living off of it. So how important is something like YouTube and how have you been engaging with this platform as an yeah, entrepreneur? I mean, it, it's interesting and it kind of fell into our laps or it definitely you know, just um, exploded without us planning to like, okay, let's figure out how to monetize YouTube. We just kind of recognize, I mean, Cartel is such a big name and he's, he's uh, like his total, all Cartel videos on YouTube, it's, it's got to be well over 100 million sort of views, you know? And so we were recognizing that people were posting the songs and the, reposting the videos. And at a certain point, we became kind of content partners with YouTube and so it, it's been um, it's been eye-opening because you know we, we do actually make um, pretty good money on sales say with the cartel album and that's kind of a continuing you know monthly revenue stream for us which is great but then it's just been amazing because when we invested money in that project and, and put the album out we didn't have YouTube in mind but actually we, we make you know I don't know I'd, I'd say like thousands of dollars a month on cartel-related YouTube revenue, you know? And so it is important, and, and, and now that we've seen that, it's it's shifting, you know, some of the business decisions we're making in terms of saying, okay, yeah, we can afford to go to Kingston and shoot a music video because this, you know, traditionally a music video is an expense that a label makes, and it's a marketing expense, and you hope to make it back in sales, but um, with what we've got going with YouTube now, it's it's actually... Not a, I mean, ideally, it is serving a marketing function, but it's, it's actually like a product to be consumed, essentially. And, and, and so ideally, it's going to at least pay for itself, if not become a, a source of its own you know, profit. So business aside, um, the fact that you put out a proper album, which is a rarity in Jamaica with this type of music, um, that's available. Um, but from a creative perspective, um, how did you approach making an album? I mean, you mentioned the first four records more or less came came about as an accident and weren't planned to be for, for an album, but was there any sort of concept to the record? Any, any sort of like overarching theme that you tried to give it to it? It was the first time for you, right? Producing a full-on album. Yeah, yeah, no, it was the first time. I mean, I, I wouldn't say there was a complete overarching concept. I mean, definitely I recognize that most, I mean, dance hall, the, the, the business side of the dance hall business is very much around rhythms and rhythm releases and singles. So a lot of times a, a big artist album is, is pretty much like a collection of their biggest hits over the last two or three years, plus a couple new, a new songs. So I, I, I thought, you know, why, why isn't someone, you know, and, and it has happened, but why, generally speaking, why hasn't there been a focus on albums? And, and maybe you could make a bigger impact. That was kind of the, the idea. Um, because, you know, particularly with with the internet, you know, collecting the singles from the last few years, you know, it's much more likely that a lot more people have heard those songs. So if you buy that album, you're very familiar with the music already. Yeah. So I just thought it might be an interesting thing where we could really just surprise everyone. I mean, Cartel was still putting out singles while we were making the, the record, and so he's very, very much 
um, staying relevant and, and pretty much staying on top of the, the dance hall industry. But like, let's let's show like a greater body of work. And you know, so I I really approached it as something like, how can we showcase cartels' talents in a very uh, well put together, or you know, try to do a well put together sort of array of songs with with a with a kind of an arc to it. Um, but there wasn't it wasn't like a total concept album in terms of it, it's all about this. I mean, I think if anything, the concept was. Let's do an album, which was almost conceptual in the dance hall context. Yeah. So you're now working on Popcorn's album as well, right? I am, yeah. So this, the the Cartel album was pretty much me on production throughout, and so for this one, it's more I'm taking more of a uh, executive producer role. I am producing a bunch of tracks on the record, but um, Double Dutch, who's a who's a mixed back artist, is doing some really great work and has a bunch of songs on it, and then we have a. Uh, a number of Jamaican producers, Andrew Blacks, and uh, Jamie Young Vibes, and then Audi Instrumentals. So it's 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 not um, completely the same sort of affair in terms of how the album's coming together, but I'm really excited to... I think we've done maybe 14 or 15 songs, and I'm hoping it'll be ready for the fall. But yeah, and that, and that should be another mixed back record as well. How's he like in the studio? How's, how's it working with him? <coughs> it's great. I mean... I, I first met him when I was making Kingston Stories. Um, he kind of came up in Cartel's crew, and so he would come around the studio sometimes. And uh, so we we had that connection. And then we've I think we've done three singles together um, since then. And yeah, I mean he he's every artist is different, and I think you know like like I mentioned with with the system, you know he really surprised me with that. With, with the content and direction he took that in. And uh, and I'd, I'd say the same goes for the album. I mean, I really think he writes amazing pop songs, you know, very much in a dance hall context, but I feel like he has a lot of, uh, I mean, he already has, but I was going to say he has a lot of ability to cross over. I mean, he, I think he has already landed in the, the Billboard Hot 100 charts, which again is kind of hard for a dance hall artist to do in the U.S., so... Yeah. That shows something, but also I think um, another interesting thing is a lot of the the biggest names in dance hall are a bit older, and and I kind of feel like that is because there used to be more money in in the dance hall business coming in from say U.S. labels, and so there was more marketing dollars to big uh, to build up those names, and then as that money has dried up, those people kind of keep the crowns that they have, so to speak. And there's really no room to build up new younger artists, and so he's kind of a rare exception, in my opinion. Um, I think he's maybe 23 or 24 years old, and he's kind of one of the biggest names in the world in terms of dance hall. So I think it's it's really refreshing that there's like a new voice speaking for a new generation, and so I think he has a lot of potential to push things kind of further in a, in a cool way that hasn't been done. Now, through you working with Cartel, I think you kind of change the sound a lot and maybe open it up to a bit more of an international audience. Like a lot of the stuff he does these days is in a way influenced by the work that you guys did together. Uh, so you developed some sort of producer-artist relationship. So when he went to jail, um, just maybe for, the, for those of you who don't know, he's currently in jail on murder charges. Um, how did you react to that? I mean, it's obviously a crazy situation. Um, how did that feel like for you, not knowing what exactly was going on? Yeah, I mean, when when I first heard he was arrested, um, you know, I didn't hear the, the charges or anything. And actually, over the course of making our album, he had been uh, arrested and kind of held without charges. And I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on the Jamaican justice system, but that initial time, you know, he was wanted for... to They, they asked him to come in for questioning, and then they said we're going to hold you for 24 hours then they said we're going to hold you for a week and then they you know it was two weeks and after two and a half weeks they kind of let him go no charges and you know at least with respect comparing that to the u.s justice system that seemed a bit odd um and so when i first heard he was arrested again i was actually we were about seven or eight days away from shooting the half on a baby video the second well, that was going to be the second single for the for the album and so I kind of just assumed, oh, he's just been picked up and he'll be held for a little bit. And 
and and, um, and released, and it's probably no big deal. So then once I heard there was murder charges, obviously I was shocked. I mean, you know, working with him, that's the last thing I think <laughs> we could possibly expect. I mean, I think that, that pretty much goes for most people I know, but, you know, um, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to to assume that he's innocent until proven guilty. And again, with the Jamaican justice system, I think it's been about two and a half years, a little bit over that, that he's been locked up with no trial and no charges. So, you know, one wonders or one hears like that he offended the wrong person and they're going to just, you know, hold him, kind of teach him a lesson and not charge him. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just want to presume that he, he was not actually involved in any of that. And, uh, hope for the best. Have you been in touch with him since? Um, obviously, <laughs> when someone's locked up, it's a bit hard to be well, well, in touch. He still manages to release, like, whatever, a couple of songs per week, even though some of the material might be old, but he seems to uh, uh, Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. Uh, yeah th there's been allegations that he's recorded in prison, but he has refuted those. Um, I have been able to talk with people close with him, so in that way, communicate on certain business stuff that we're dealing with and You know, he he basically has communicated that he's keeping his head up and doing all right. But yeah, not a lot of direct communication. So a lot of your music, obviously, there's there's a Jamaican influence. Um, there's a some of your early releases on Mixpack had a lot of remixes by European producers. Um, you have a Japanese band on your label. Um, how much do you think? How much of New York is in your music? Is that to any importance for you, or is it just? a place where you happen to live and happen to have a family but don't really care that much beyond that yeah no I mean I, I don't know what what a listener would say but for me you know I, like I, I love listening to uh, and, and have been for years Funkmaster Flex you know and just um, it's such a a rare thing at least in the US to have a radio DJ that has that much flexibility with what he plays Flexibility. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and and so you know, just just that there's hip hop. Obviously, was born in New York, and and still has has a strong vibe. And then also, you know, New York has a really big Caribbean community, Jamaican community, and I think that that's definitely been influential. But you know, I think just just the concrete, the the, the architecture and and the vibe itself in ways that I probably don't even understand. But yeah, you know, I, I definitely, one thing I've taken is that music can sound different in different locations. You know, I, I, I don't know that I could describe it that well, but definitely hearing certain songs in Kingston, it kind of comes with a feeling of what what I'm experiencing, what I'm seeing, who I'm with. And, and, and the same would go with New York and pretty much anywhere. But, you know, so being in New York and making music, I'm sure that's had a big impact. So you mentioned your hip-hop influence. You recently worked on an album by a relatively well-known rapper. Um, maybe we should play a record off of that. Unified. 
Come on and ride with us Put your lighters up Get high with me Fly with me Ain't no dividing us East side, west side, north side, south side Unified Ain't no dividing us, we choose the destiny And we don't need no negative to get the best of me, yeah Love and unity alone can get to me Or if a girl need me So if you know a lot of love is spread But you like to me Feel better than fear, try and get the right to love Get all you, stop the war, make no shots, no buzz Bust up and don't make the vibes turn up, yeah Put your lighters up, yeah Get high with me Fly with me, ain't no dividing us East side, west side, north side, south side, unified Come on and ride with us So what's it like working with your childhood hero? <laughs> oh, you know, yeah, it was, I think when I, when I heard, uh, basically Diplo brought me in on this project and when I heard um, who it was. He initially said, you know, I want to partner with you, bring you in on this project, but I can't tell you who it is. <laughs> You're <laughs> like, like, oh, yeah, great. Yeah, I was like, sounds good. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, uh, when, when he eventually told me who it was, I mean, that was kind of amazing because definitely I grew up listening to Snoop. And uh, and then definitely, like, the first day we were in the studio, Snoop had his wife there, and, you know, it was just, like, playing him tracks and watching him just kind of, like, bang his head to something I made, you know, five days before. It was kind of a surreal experience, but you know, then obviously we we had to get to work, and uh, yeah, it was it was a just a, a pure pleasure working with him. Did you make the music specifically for that, like <coughs> with the idea in mind that you now need to produce a reggae album for Snoop Dogg, or was that stuff that you had already done before and just thought could work well on this on this album? Yeah, no, I think pretty much every single thing I did for the album was done for this album. Um, I think. Diplo basically brought me in and said Snoop is wanting to do a, uh, like the directive was essentially Snoop is wanting to do an album recorded in Jamaica that's kind of inspired by the a, a wide range of Jamaican music. Um, so before I before I got to Jamaica, I probably made, I don't know, 20, 20 tracks with a lot of different types of ideas. So how do you feel about, well, let's, let me put it that way. There's quite a few people who feel like he shouldn't be doing that. And it's not real reggae, and it's disrespectful to the culture where it comes from. Um, and regardless of whether he did a good job on on that album or not as a vocalist, but he basically doesn't have to write to adopt certain like symbols, images, and and play around with this sort of terminology and 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 symbolism that means quite a lot to a few people, even on a religious level. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, obviously, I I can recognize that it could be complicated ground to tread but um i felt like you know obviously aside from just making the music i got to spend a lot of time with snoop and 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 he really shared the story of why he wanted to make this record and it felt like a very genuine sort of impulse just um and and, and essentially what he shared which he's said many other times publicly is is you know he, he's getting to a certain point in his life where he really wants to um leave or add to his legacy with a different kind of spirit and content in the music. And, you know, I, 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 I personally wouldn't fault him for wanting to make music inspired by Jamaican music and collaborating with, with different artists in Jamaica. So I don't know. I, I, I think the main thing is or, or the way I would look at something like that, whether it was his project or someone else is what, what kind of attitude is this person bringing to this and, and you know are they sincere in what they say they want to do and he really felt like he was on something like a spiritual journey um, and so you know I, I, I felt you know honored to be a part of that process So how was it like working with a producer like Diplo in the studio <coughs> who I think takes a lot of the times would take more of a curator role and like put together people who we believe would work amazingly well together <coughs> in the studio and it's a lot of times not quite clear what he did on the beat and then some beats he makes by himself. So how exactly was the kind of collaboration between you and him? Yeah, I mean, well, he's he's got a great musical mind, great producer, um, probably one of the hardest working people I've come across in this business. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. He's probably on tour 
200 to 300 days a year and yet he really is making time to go into the studio like in any country or any city he's in um but yeah i mean in the studio like over the course of the the, the work we did here you know some of the songs are 100 percent from his mind and his his uh vision and other songs are collaborations between all the producers and then you know like some of these songs are there were more things that i brought to the table but then he said hey what if we switch the beat up like this or you know so i mean i, f I feel like he's just a very you know because he's, he's both a producer he's a label a label owner and just um kind of a cultural figure in a way so he's kind of hitting different projects from different angles but you know, it, it, it was definitely a great experience to get to see him work and to collaborate with him and, and just to see his mind. I mean, I think being a DJ can be a real asset to a producer, I mean, depending on the music you make. But I think he has a real intuitive sense of what's going to work. And, you know, it might be, um, hey, wait, we need to speed this track up 10 BPM so we can play it in this context in the club, that sort of thing where... I think a lot of producers might not have that relationship, but uh, yeah, I mean, he, he he's a great producer, so I don't know that he always gets enough credit for that. How does it feel like as a if you put something out on Mixpack, you make a beat, record vocals, um, would whatever work on the arrangement, mix it, and put it out on your own label, so you have full control. In a situation like this, where you work on a major label record with other producers other people might have different opinions um how does it feel like hearing your music which is your music in a way but then again it's also other people's music and might not sound exactly like your vision was like when you started out making that track yeah i mean it's an interesting aspect of kind of the the business dictating certain creative stuff i mean yeah like you say when i when i do something on mixback it's pretty much something that I have a great amount of control over. I mean, if I'm working with a vocalist, I'm still, you know, I don't tell the vocalist what to say, oh, yeah. you know, and that sort of thing. Um, but you could always not release it. <laughs> that has happened. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I mean, sometimes with a vocalist, we will have a conversation like, I think the song could be about this, you know, whether it's Cartel or Popcorn or someone else. But a lot of times, and probably the majority, I'm kind of letting the, the vocalist dictate that to me. Um, but... You know, I, I guess it's you have to ask yourself what you want out of your own creative energy and output. I mean, if you are working in a major label context, I mean, there's there's many different ways it goes down. But, you know, there's A&Rs who work for the label. And a lot of times A&Rs, say, in, in, the, in the rap world, are looking for beats. Um, then you have artist managers who might bring the beat in. And you might have a, have a beat that, in your mind, was kind of like a sketch of the idea and it gets to the rapper, and the next thing you know, you hear it, and it's released, and you were like, but I was going to change the outro, or something like that, you know, or I would have flipped it a little different, or just mixed it differently. Um, so, you know, I, I guess you have to be aware of what kind of game you're playing in. Are you comfortable in that role, like ceding some control? Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess it's, it's like very much a case-by-case basis and also you might not realize that you don't <laughs> that you have an issue with it until it's too late um so it's definitely a learning thing in terms of you know it's a very personal thing that you have to learn your own relationship with it is, is that something that you see yourself doing in the future like doing the next rihanna album or something like that or would you rather uh produce rhythms and record artists that you like or w what's the kind of vision for moving forward yeah i mean i i, I definitely want to keep working with artists that i really admire um that i personally kind of have an affinity for and have like an emotional kind of response to um but that's not to say that i wouldn't want to work with a rihanna or someone like that i mean i i i'm interested in in working with you know at the highest level essentially not not financially but just just you know as a producer who wants to work with vocalists and songwriters you know it's a it's a great opportunity to be able to work with the best songwriters quote unquote or the the best singers you know with great voices that sort of thing so i mean i i'm kind of essentially um actively kind of pursuing both you know a lot of stuff like i'm doing this popcorn record 
Um, at the same time, we're, we're bringing in some pretty major rappers to do guest verses on the Popcorn record, but we do have a lot of control over that. And, and, and yet at the same time, yeah, I have a bunch of different things kind of in motion with major labels that, you know, I'm not going to assume will all, you know, work out well, but um, that, I'm, that I'm happy to be pursuing that as well. Um, but really, yeah, I think if I was just in one side of that, um, only doing kind of mixed back stuff or only doing major label stuff, I don't think that that would be kind of enough for me. And I think by doing kind of all of it or different different pro types of projects with different levels of control or input, um, it kind of serves my different areas of interests. So, yeah, I think before we open this up to questions, I'd love to play one more record. Um, <coughs> Which is this here. Up there, up there, my team. Up there, up there, up there. Get us something. Up there, up there. Team turn up, yeah. None of them can't test me. What must say? Up there, up there, my team. Up there, up there, up there. Get us something. Up there, up there. Team turn up, yeah. None of them can't test me. Me, ah, me a champion, bubbler, hot bubbler. Why do it like me in the country? Why not go dum? Why not go dum? Why not go dum? I'm a catchy tasker. Champion bubbler, can't test me. When me tick it like a clock and then me six thirty. Why not go dum? Why not go dum? Why not go dum? I'm a catchy tasker. My waist have a bunch of power, well charged up. So tell a dirty girl, she not for talk up. My put the double in a wine, take the ace out of my spine. Left the man, them all up on him so caught up. Yeah, you never know, you better ask somebody. And then we tell him, I have a champion winery. But we ask Chris, so not y'all can't test me. What's with this stuff? My foot from position of my body. I'm champion, bubbler, ask for me. Wine the road like me, me and country. Wine and go down, wine and come up. Wine and go down, I'm a go down. I'm a catch it and scum. Champ, champion, bubbler, can't test me. With my ticket, clack, 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 and then me 630. Wine and go down, wine and come up. Wine and go down, I'm a catch it and scum. A witch girl want competition chant She better know me wine where I'm man, man You never hear about my mate to wine song Why not wine for me now for we do bad and chant Cock up my bump and position for me head Foot over shoulder me will raise any deed The wine I practice till we reach for the bed Wine it, wine it, wine it till me run the something green I'm champion bubbler, ask for me Wine the road like me name country Wine and go down, wine and come up Wine and go down, I'm going catch it and scoop So, do we have any questions? That's a question in the back. Hey there, I don't know if I can see you through this crowd of people, but uh, hey. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, when you're getting into the room with a vocalist, um, do you ever have occasions where maybe the vibe just isn't there and they'll, they'll leave without recording something on top of the <laughs> rhythms you've made for them? Um, I mean, I think, let me, let me think about that. I mean, so, uh, like in, in, in Jamaica, I'm, I'm, I'm just about always working with the artists. Yeah. Um, sometimes in the U.S. I'm working with a kind of like a top line songwriter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe the track's going to be for someone to be determined or something like that. Um, I think it's pretty rare that I, we leave the room without something. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes... Obviously, there's been times where it's like hard to get, you know, the vibe. Um, in, in a lot of ways, like obviously, I have less work to do in that moment because I've kind of made the track, and you know, so sometimes the vocalist or the the, the songwriter rather is is just kind of, you know, having a mental block of some kind, or, or just you know they, they don't care for the track or not responding to it. So I, I guess I guess there's been a few times. I mean, I think. Um, I did a track with Popcon called Kit Gal Easy and it was we we did a session with where he did the system and uh and this other track so we do it and get Gal Easy that we were gonna do all three of those in a day. And when it got time to do Get Gal Easy he was which which did not have that title because it wasn't written, but he said, Let's let's link back tomorrow. Um but then I got a text like in the middle of the night being like, Oh yeah, by the way, I recorded that. So, you know, for whatever reason, I don't know if he was hungry or just, you know, he was tired in the moment. Yeah, he, he was like, 
let's let's come back to that. But you know, in the end, he recorded to it. And do you have like a ritual to get the vocalists kind of in the right mindset when you get into the studio with them? Well, hmm. I mean, it, it, it really depends. I, I would say not really. I usually kind of let the vocalist kind of carry forth with whatever ritual is going to work for them. I mean, usually in Jamaica, I kind of am working out of the studio that the, the personal vocalist is most comfortable with. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like their home studio. Um, and so they probably are kind of, that's part of their own ritual. You know, working in New York, if I have someone by my studio, you know, I just, I, I would say actually just, if, if you want advice, just ask the vocalist, you know, what, how, how do you want to do this? I mean, recently um, I, I was working with this vocalist, uh, a New York based vocalist, Wavy Spice, and it was a studio that kind of you could walk out and get up on a roof roof deck and so we just put the instrumental on her phone and she took it up onto the roof like away from me and just kind of took an hour and a half two hours to herself kind of looking at the new york skyline and wrote it so you know i I think really just making or giving the the vocalist or the writer the opportunity to make themselves comfortable and really respect whatever it is they need to do to get comfortable to write it you know a song that they can connect with. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, I know you work with Lil Scrappy. You've produced a track for him and released it on Mixpack. I was wondering if you could maybe just speak a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, that that track, I mean, process-wise, wasn't super different from, from some of these tracks I've done in Jamaica. I, w- I went down to... Atlanta and and linked with him at this studio called S Line, um, which is kind of like a rap, a, a well known rap studio down there. And yeah, I mean he was interesting. He actually, um, super nice, humble, uh, dedicated artist. And he 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 shared a pretty interesting story with me that he kind of came up in the in the game writing down his lyrics, you know, kind of having like a lyric notebook. And then he met DJ Toomp, who was working with T.I. a lot. And Toomp, I guess, convinced him to stop writing his lyrics. And, and he kind of did a process similar to Cartel, where he would, he would it's like a dance between the, the engineer and the vocalist. And so the writing is happening to the microphone live. And it might be just like bar by bar or, you know, a few bars at a time. Um, but he was kind of explaining to me that for him it made the record, the, the performance and the writing more real in, in his words. And so basically, I think what he meant by that is, you know, if he's reading off a pen and paper, you know, there's a part of his mind that's focused on reading while he's trying to rap. And, and by just literally coming from his mind, it can be like a more direct kind of performance. And, 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 and the other thing I notice about that is it can really become about the sounds and the enunciation and the pronounce, how, how you're pronouncing different things because... Sometimes it's it's the way you say something that makes something so catchy, you know, that it's, it's the, the words or like the, the drawl or the what, however you do it, the timing. Um, that might be the most important thing for the song. So that was cool to, to hear his take on that and to, to see it happen. Okay, cool. Thank you. They both come from the same camp, but what's the difference between working with cartel and popcorn? Um, well, I mean, obviously, every everyone's an individual in, the, in in many different ways. But you know, I think w- without um, saying anything negative about Popcorn, because he he's a great songwriter and a great vocalist. I mean, cartel, I just think has had so many years of writing so many songs that, I mean, his, his understanding of song structure and of how to, how to do certain things. I mean, I'll, I'll tell a little story about Cartel that, that, that was, he, he blew my mind in a number of different ways, but he would do something where he would often like say it's a, it's a hook. He'll, he'll record bar one, then he'll skip bar two and write something for bar three. Then he'll go back and write bar two and bar four. And so it was like this weird sort of filling in this puzzle. 
And my take on that is that there's something, there's something actually like subtly catchy about what happens when you hear the lyric. You'd never listen back and, and think like, oh, that sounds like that was recorded out of order. But there, there might be something almost subconsciously that's more catchy about the, the recorded quality of that. Um, and then also it has like implications for the songwriting in terms of what words he's choosing and stuff like that. And I think the craziest thing he did once, there was a 12 bar verse in a song and he recorded bar 12, then he recorded bar 11, bar 10, and he literally recorded the entire verse, wrote it and recorded it backwards. And I was just like, what the hell is going on? You know, because I've, I've never heard of anything like that. Um, but like upon reflection, I'm thinking, okay, he knows lyrically where this verse is ending up so he can build a path to that end and, 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 and likewise with the melody. So there's kind of like a, a kind of a genius in working that way. I, I don't know that many people could do it even if they wanted to try to do that. But, you know, so I, I, I really say just the, the, the difference with Cartel is probably he's, he's recorded, as I said, three or 4,000 songs. Popcon has done a lot less. But, you know, everyone's, I'm, I'm, as, as important as that might be, that kind of experience, you know, someone who's recorded two songs might write the most amazing song that's ever been written, you know. So it's not um, a requirement that you've had that experience. Um, but I'd say with PopCon, I think he it takes maybe a more measured approach. And th there has been times that I, I should have, um, on the previous question, mentioned that, it, like with the, the Get Gal Easy song, PopCon took the instrumental and, and, you know, put it in his car and drove around Kingston all afternoon, um, or all night, I guess I should say. And so, you know, I, I definitely never saw Cartel take instrumentals and live with them, but occasionally PopCon will do that. And, uh, you know, again, it's whatever works for the vocalist. You know, I like listening to music in a car, and you definitely might catch a different inspiration from that context. Cool. And um, just one other question about the Champion Bubbler with Tiffa. What's the difference between working with female artists in dance hall and male artists in dance hall? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I've seen, you know, something that, that would stand out as a, as a difference. I mean, her process, in my experience, she, she likes to get the, the instrumental maybe the night before and spend some time with it, and then she'll come in uh, with something more fleshed out, maybe not done, but maybe a hook or some ideas, a hook in one verse. Um, but yeah, no, she, she's a good friend and a great, great vocalist. But yeah, I don't know if I could really tease out the differences on that. Cool. Thanks. Hey. Um, I think like one one of the most interesting things on the um, on like your whole story is like you were you were just doing music and then you, you saw like a window I guess or something like was this was this like rational like did you when when your love happened and like there was obviously like a different sound I've never heard anything with the dancehall artist on top like that sounded like that before was it because the way, like there's a room full of people and everyone's like from different country like from Argentina to whatever and I even I did my whole life like that as well like I saw a window and I took it and I think that's that's kind of like how I got out of like Portugal or how like I got into music and stuff like that and like was that a rational thing like did you actually saw it and were you like conscious okay this is I made I made a different sound here and I should push this button more often so I get more beats that sound like this and do like a little like side road for dance hall or whatever and, and this is gonna be like my signature thing. Was that a I I mean I think at that point it was it was probably more random than than you know, like a very conscious decision. Actually that that first track for your love, the you know, I, I hadn't met Cartel, so I had actually sent a different instrumental to him and I think I waited three or four months. And I kept every week, it was like, yeah, yeah, he's, he's going to be recording it this week, you know, and, and just kind of endlessly like that. So I was kind of wondering, is this really going to happen? And then after three or four months, I got an email saying like, you know what, you got to send something different. Um, and so I had the, the, the rhythm for your love on my computer and I kind of polished it a little bit. 
So in a way, it wasn't <laughs> intentional. At all. Like after after you did it, I, I mean, it was more like after like you actually saw the result of it. Was oh. was it something like you wanted like to grab and and, and explore like that? Um, you know, I, I guess to a small degree, but maybe it was almost more unconscious. You know, I mean, I definitely when I made that track, I wasn't thinking like, oh, this is my take on dance hall that's going to be different in these specific ways. You know, I mean. There, there's certain differences maybe you know that people could tease out or talk about but I think it was just kind of being true to where my head was at at that time in terms of synth sounds or percussion or something like that it wasn't super calculated because I still don't know <laughs> what exactly I did or how I would describe it thanks Okay, uh, so nobody's asked this question yet, so I guess I'll just bite the bullet. Uh, the uh, the Vibes Cartel prison break hoax, uh, can, do you have any like insight into like the motive behind that? Um, I do not. Um, I, w I would say, you know, it, it, it was kind of amazing. I mean, we were getting contacted by like financial magazines in India wanting information so it really became this crazy global story um i have no reason to suspect that it was cartel who who created that story but at the same time i mean one thing i, I really look at cartel and the way he handled his career in the last few years as like a conceptual artist almost approaching it in a really extremely contemporary interesting way and so he would I would say, you know, he, he was very good at manipulating the media to have, like, constant stories about him every week. There's a huge scandal, and it's hard to really understand just how seriously these scandals would, would take hold in, in Kingston and in Jamaica. I mean, it was really, like, headline news, like, every week. Like, cartel got braces. And, you know, he would say in interviews, like, yeah, I just got braces just, just to mess with y'all. You know, like just just because that would be a weird thing to do, and so he was constantly creating these stories and creating this larger myth about himself. And so, I wouldn't be that surprised if uh, if he if he participated in that. But at the same time, you know, it may have just been like a blogger who realized they would get a lot of traffic if they made that story up. So and really the, these scandals, they don't necessarily correlate with album releases or anything. They're just in order to keep his name into the the public eye. Yeah, I mean, I, I never had a, a deep conversation on that with him, but definitely not related to album releases. I mean, it might have just been a way he entertained himself or, you know, I mean, maybe he's uh, naturally eccentric in certain ways and realized, like, people are responding to this, so I'm going to share this more with the world. Thank you. Any other questions? No one? Good. Then I guess we just wrap this up. Give a huge round of applause for Dre Skull. <laughs> <laughs>